So, uh, thanks again for joining us tonight to learn what are the best practices that we could take out from the digital session. We are joined here by four amazing individuals that pioneered this project as, uh, in their capacity as leadership. So first of all, I would like to go through a quick introduction of who it is here today that would actually be speaking to you today. And let's start with Chris. Christopher, would you like to say two, three things about yourself? Um, yes, so I'm Chris. I'm from Berlin, Germany. I've been active in EYP since 2012. Um, I'm now 24 years old. And um, yeah, I was the head organizer of the event. Cool. And Stefan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Stefan. I'm from Belgrade, Serbia. I was the president of the event um, and I'm in UAP since 2014. And Stefan is not by his own in the screen. There's also Katerina and Luca. Uh, Katerina, do you want to say a couple of words about yourself and maybe Luca could follow? Yeah. Hi, I'm Katerina um, from Serbia. And I'm one of the two editors at the first digital session. And the other one is Luca, who can uh, say a little bit about himself now. Sure. Um, I'm Luca. I'm connected from lovely Trieste, uh, the easternmost uh, of, uh, of Italy. I joined uh, like Stefan in 2014. And together with Katarina, again, I, I was the editor for uh, the session. Thank you, Luca. And thank you to all four of you for, first of all, being here tonight, and second of all, taking on this big project. And the way this webinar is structured is that first, uh, these four cool EY peers will present their findings and their thoughts on what it means to have an event online, what kind of resources you need, how do you go about structuring your work as a president or as a media person or as an organizer. Uh, but before we dive into all of this, I want to quickly introduce to you why this project, I think, is, is really special. It really stands out from what EYP is usually doing. And at the same time, it really is, to a certain extent, pivot of what EYP really is about. So um, I think, I really think that um, the wildest creativity, it must be bound. There must be something that could, you could put yourself in a little box and be creative in this space. And for this project, it was really this really sad situation with the pandemic now, where uh, all of the EYP events were canceled. And then we in the office, we thought, hey, how about we try to do some events digitally? Can we actually have a session online? And of course, I think as many of you, a lot of people had their double thoughts about it. There are a lot of things about this process that are very unclear, like how do you do team building? How do you make sure participants are engaged and they stay online and they don't just turn off their cameras whenever they are too tired? Um, and uh, this project really turned out to be a huge success. We already shared with you a little guide that talks about in detail which resources we decided to go for, uh, how communication took place. Uh, but just to give you a few highlights, um, during the event, the organizers uh, managed to implement a scavenger hunt using Google Maps in Teams. Uh, if you were uh, joining the Euro concert, and if you stayed a little bit longer to hear what participants were talking after it on a Zoom meeting, it really felt like your classical EYP long night, long talks experience. And would you like to take a guess how many people dropped out during the session? It was one person because of the internet problem. So otherwise, if uh, in Europe we had good internet, it would have been zero. So with this introduction, I would like to uh, give it up for the head organizer of this great event, Christopher. Okay, um, so just to give you guys a brief introduction into the event itself. Um, so, I mean, as well as said, for me, it was an absolutely incredible experience. Um, I always knew it would be possible from the very beginning. Uh, so I never had any doubt about the concept, um, but I honestly didn't expect it to go that well. Um, 
I saw many problems arising on the horizon, um, but we managed to um, get through them. Um, all of us, um, when I say all of us, we had 111 participants from 35 countries, uh, some of them from the most remote parts of Europe. And that's also why we believe that digital sessions offer several advantages to regular sessions. Um, and now I just quickly want to explain you what those advantages are and how they can be used at future digital sessions and why there should be more digital sessions in general in the future. Um, but let's start on the negative aspect. I mean, it's quite clear. The thing that's lacking if you do something digital is the physical contact. Um, so whatever you do, how special your program might be, um, what you can't get rid of is that you don't have the physical touch. Um, so we try to work around that. Um, and we identify many points of advantage um, that you have. First of all, it's um, the budget. So digital sessions are really cheap, um, if not free to organize. The only thing that you need is the people behind the project, but the project itself can be run completely for free, um, especially now that we've got the Zoom sponsorship uh, which you can request from the international office. It's literally completely for free um, to organize one. Um, second of all, you have the outreach element. So even if participants can't afford to travel to regular sessions, um, they can just join in online. Literally the only thing you need is an internet connection. Um, it's very inclusive. We managed to include people um, with disabilities, people that can't, couldn't really see properly, stuff like that, um, which is only possible due to the online format. Um, it's really transparent, I believe, um, maybe too transparent, that's up to debate, um, but everything you do is obviously documented in a way, and um, you can just show and present everything you've done. Um, and also it's flexible, it's really flexible. Um, at usual sessions, if you have a delay in the program for 10, 15 minutes, that's a main, a major issue because you have the venues, you need to go there at a certain time, you need to leave at a certain time. And um, online it's much more flexible, obviously. Um, so if a speaker reschedules 15 minutes in advance of his speech, it's no problem because you can just announce that and you can shift the program accordingly. Um, so what I want to emphasize for all of you is um, that the digital format offers a lot of advantages, uh, which in my opinion definitely outweigh the one big disadvantage of the lack of physical contact. Um, and I think they will become more and more popular um, also after COVID-19. So I don't see this only um, as a project that should be run during the Corona crisis, but also afterwards. Um, just because of all the opportunities it offers, um, also because I'm expecting there to be an economic fallout after the crisis. So it's going to be really difficult for national committees to get funds to organize regular sessions. And also many participants might face um, some monetary issues. Um, as I said, it's completely free to organize. It's completely free to participate. The only thing is the electricity bill and the internet access. Um, I think that's kind of given in Europe. Um, and yeah, we, we therefore would like to urge national committees um, to acknowledge digital sessions, um, that they will remain a present factor from now on in the network. Um, they're obviously by no means meant to replace regular sessions. Um, we still enjoy them a lot. Um, but I think it can be something additional, especially in those hard times. Um, and later on, you will be given the floor to ask me as many questions as you want. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, but I'm going to stop speaking now just to give you more time for questions later on. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Christopher. Um, moving on, maybe, uh, Stefan, if you could talk a little bit about how it was from your perspective as a president. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Well, um, at first, when I saw the, the call for the president for the session itself, I was quite scared and I was worried that, as everyone mentioned in, in, 
in their questions in the form, like how do we surpass the problem of not having this physical touch and just like how to overcome the difficulties of team building online and stuff like that. But then I remember if I apply as a president, I won't have to kind of, you know, chair the committee, but rather help the people to do that and kind of find the necessary ideas, knowledge, inspiration, and so on for them to do that. So therefore I applied and we had amazing chairpersons and the whole academic team board included who uh, chaired at the event and helped us integrate um, the basic ideas of UIP to this digital format. So none of these things that we'll be talking about was uh, created specifically by myself or Christopher, Katarina or Luca, but rather by the teams and chairs, orgas, media team members who kind of worked on their own in their own community rooms or Zoom rooms to develop this, uh, to leave it for the network in the future. So from my, from my perspective, I indeed was scared about the team building especially, but then um, since I was selected and since I started working with uh, Valeria, Helena, Chris, and so on, uh, we kind of brainstormed all the possible platforms that can serve um, as more or less like substitutions for our regular team building activities. So then I'm not sure whether we already shared the handbook with the participants. Yeah, cool, thank you. Um, so there's this handbook that's kind of being developed or is developed, but in the handbook itself, we have a spreadsheet with team building games and activities that we kind of found while preparing the event. So it kind of like just a spoiler, it works the same as it would in real life or in person, but it kind of lacks the physical touch that can be kind of, you know, um, created online, obviously, but all the other games like name games, icebreakers, whatever, problem solvers, I like whatever, literally they can be done online. Like the only obvious problem that we found was that we couldn't find, find any like trust games or something like that it was a difficulty for the team to find online, but there are other games that can kind of serve to overcome the difficulty of the lack of those games. And now um, I'll talk uh, in detail about that in the future with the questions coming up, but there's one thing that I want to kind of focus on, which is the timeline uh, of the session and specifically for the academic team that from my point of view was extremely, not tough, but like it was harder for uh, people to work in such timeline because, so when I was selected, I had three weeks to, um, well, select the team. So there was a week to get people to apply and then to select people and then to involve everyone and just brief them on what has happened so far. Um, and basically, since I selected my team or we selected the academic team, we had like 10 or nine day days to come up with the uh, topic overviews and to start working with committees, which is something that seemed scary in the beginning, but like, the, the team managed to do the, the, the complete TOs in two and a half days. And we had like three to four days uh, to do that. I mean, I'm quite proud um, with the topic overviews and the whole booklet. I think it looks very good, especially because it was, so we increased the amount of committees from six to 10 last minute because we had high interest of delegates, of chairpersons are generally for, the, the, for all officials teams. And I think it was quite successful. So for me, like my biggest takeaway for that would be that if you're planning already to have a digital session in your NC for a country, you should definitely look to kind of have more than four weeks to uh, work on the event just to kind of ease up the schedule. And especially once we get back to our normal lives, I think, um, well, we'll all have schools, universities, jobs and stuff like that where we won't be stuck at home. And yeah, I mean, that's my main takeaway from, from the timeline. But, uh, but as I said, we'll talk more about that um, during the Q&A uh, thing. I mean, G yeah, just the last thing that I want to mention, for me, the GA that we had was extremely interesting. It was something that I would love to see at future events because it was different and it was just much more dynamic. And I really um, enjoyed the, the new format. But yeah, that's it for now. Great, thank you, Stefan. 
Um, then followed by you, by you is the Katerina and Luca. How was it for you to edit in a session where you couldn't take any pictures? Huh. Um, it was honestly refreshing for the both of us because we uh, both study design and it was nice to apply something to my university in EYP. And um, in general, it was, it was very, it was a breath of fresh air in media because what we were aiming to do with the session, since it's um, a pioneer on its own with the format, it's also a pioneer of its own with uh, the media output because we were looking for more unorthodox methods of creating projects through design, I don't know, podcasts, radio shows, interact with projects with the delegates directly on the Discord channel. Um, but our focus mainly was on people's experience and creativity. But when we say experience, we don't mean like session history. We mean more like creative experience in life. So we had first timers, we had fifth timers, we had um, people who dabbled in sessions before, but in a different position. But all of them were incredibly creative and it was uh, truly a really great experience to work with them. Um, also like with the whole time constraint thing where we had to select a team very quickly and start working with them very quickly, the brainstorming process was actually incredibly rewarding because uh, just in like two days, literally 48 hours, we already had minimum 10 projects and it was a breeze uh, to go through them. And uh, in the end, it was, it was really refreshing. Um, I should give the word to Luca as well because we should cover some stuff with the like work organization and how it happened. So I'll let Luca speak now. Sure. I mean, um, same as Stefan said was true for us. Uh, the uh, creation of the project was an amazing uh, thing to, to see happen. Uh, the way that <coughs> it happened so quickly, the way that they took some ideas we maybe proposed in the beginning and maybe changed them completely or adapted them sometimes. Um, spending a few more words on experience, I think this can be considered really the culmination of a long process that has happened in UAP Media for the years. And we have seen that with the big, big project we are working on. Uh, as of now, we, we've seen it already with what Daniele has been doing with Time Capsule. If you haven't seen that, I highly advise, advise you take a look at that. Uh, it's a series of video where we explore how UAP moved from analog to digital. Uh, and what changed in media was uh, the shift from reporting, in a sense, to um, focusing on the experience of delegates, the uh, bonding between delegates outside the committee. Uh, and here, um, as, uh, as Valeria said in the beginning, uh, our creativity was bound and was bound by the fact that we couldn't take picture, we couldn't report. And so we had to leave that aspect that has been the main focus of EWP Media for so many years completely behind and completely focused on experience this time. Uh, and this uh, may have been very challenging in the beginning, but then again, we've seen that the projects have been awesome. And I think it's it has been a very big um, learning moment for every one of us because it's the same shift that is happening with big brand that we see moving from just broadcasting their message to uh, embodying it in their activities. And so with the projects, we have to, we have to make the principles of EWB, uh, the, the learning aspect, the inclusivity aspect, very, very tangible for the delegates and not just showing it in a graphic way, in a sense. As for the organization of work, that has been very challenging as well, because for, uh, for many of us, that was the first time that our normal life and EWB were not so uh, divided in a clear way. Um, mainly that meant that we had to be uh, very focused on the schedules and times because of course people had their own lectures to follow. Um, uh, something we put a lot of attention on was uh, feedback calls, one-on-one -on -one calls with the media team. Uh, that has been very challenging at times because it required us, like the two of us, to be long hours uh, in, uh, uh, on Skype. Um, and of course, that was only possible through um, something called the availability tracker. So we basically just took the time of, of when everyone was available to have, uh, to have Skypes and try to fit everything in those, in those time slots. Uh, we also used uh, project metrics. That was something very similar to what happens normally during a session. Uh, the positive aspect of doing it in a digital forum was that we didn't have to go tell them how things were going. We just had to uh, 
uh, update them via the chat and everything was clearly uh, visible in this Excel we had and we worked on. Uh, so I think uh, under this aspect, having a bird's eye view of all the project through the drive was a big plus for the, for the work of media. Mm. And let's say that was about it for now. Uh, of course, there's um, some questions we we've not came up during the uh, with the forum, and I think we're going to cover those uh, more in depth during during the Q and A. Yeah, I'd just like to add one more thing before we uh, go to the next point. Uh, it's just that just one specific thing about this session for from the media perspective was that it was not an NC event, and so we had like a very close cooperation with the international office which is something that's usually reserved for international sessions. Um, and it's very specific when creating content. So um, it, our work focused a lot on what EYP is and how the community was formed and how it shifted throughout the year. So it was also refreshing to tackle that from that perspective as well. And it was very, it was very nice to have that sort of cooperation and creativity uh, bloom through something professional that can be um, Share throughout the network and fitting for the uh, future use for future generations of delegates to come. Thank you, Katerina and uh, Luca. And if you have not seen the, their media projects, please go to our Instagram and check them out. They're really incredible, especially the interviews that you managed to do with some alumni. Uh, I found it to be very inspirational. Uh, now we would be moving to the second part uh, of the webinar, which is the Q&A. And for that, we would require to get a little bit digital. Uh, Christopher, do you want to introduce? Mm, exactly. Um, so this wouldn't be a webinar about the digital session without some kind of digital interaction. Um, so what we're going to do or what you are going to do now is um, we would ask you to go to menti.com um, and there it's going to ask you for a code and you just um, enter 874423. And you and can then, do it both with your phone or with your computer. Exactly. And then in a second, we move forward to the next slide and there we can collect your input. Um, I'm just going to give everyone 20 or 30 seconds to join. I can see some people have joined already. Okay, so I'm going to move forward to the next slide. Don't worry, you can still join if you haven't joined yet. Um, so first of all, what we wanted to ask you are the advantages of a digital EYP session. So right now on your screen, you should have the opportunity to submit what you think are advantages. Um, preferably <laughs> submit more than one letter. <laughs> right, inclusive, that's a good one. Free. Chris, love. <laughs> so basically down here, you can see how many people submitted their ideas already. Um, and as you can see, it gives you quite a structured output of the ideas that have been submitted. Um, the words that are showed the biggest now are the ones most frequently submitted. Um, let's still wait for a second because it's still moving a lot. Um, but what I can already see is free. Um, so that's a great advantage. Um, it runs at zero budget. Um, accessibility, um, that's also something um, I tried to cover in my first speech. Um, so it basically gives everyone the opportunity to join. Um, we also observed this um, during this first digital session. We had 20% um, of the people joining EYP for the first time. We also checked um, their um, addresses or like where, where they come from, where they live. And some of them are from really remote parts of Europe. Um, so ju just judging by physical locations, we had a really inclusive 
international event. Um, also, this seems to be very funny. I see you all <laughs> laughing at your cameras. Is it due to the fact that there's so much movement going on? Or <laughs> I think there is a great keyword. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> I mean, the, the session wouldn't have been the same without Stefan's moustache, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> also, I'm very impressed to see that we've got 150 submissions already. Um, do, you, do you guys want to, show, uh, want to speak about any of the other aspects, keywords mentioned? Stefan, do you want to say something? <laughs> I can speak in his name. I think um, the prerequisite for future digital events should be mustaches, judging by the, the word bubble right now. Yeah, I mean, just to clarify for people who weren't uh, at the event. So basically, yeah, I guess the heat is there. Hi, Yeet. Um, so the, the thing is that, yeah, it was a joke from the event about me growing the quarantine uh, mustache for the first time in my life, obviously, because they look like this and I do not want other people to see me um, rocking these at the streets of Belgrade or any other city or village or anywhere, to be honest. But yeah, okay, there is another quite fancy word. Um, Let's try not to. Yeah, please keep it PG-13. <laughs> yeah, but as I can see, there are many uh, great ideas um, I, I, I could maybe add something on one of the points about uh, sim simple to get or easier to get experts. And uh, indeed for us, we had some really high level experts joining the digital session. And of course it's, it's a lot easier to get them online because from them it requires so, it doesn't require for them to travel somewhere to spend so much time. It's really, you know, one hour talk and they can be there. And this is a really cool chance for, for anyone organizing this events digitally to reach out to your members of parliament or ministers or CEOs of cool companies or startups that you think would be interesting to introduce them to, to the EYP audience. Yeah, I mean, there's also one thing that um, Chris already mentioned um, for several times, but I think that should be kind of um, stressed out more, um, which is the possibilities of outreach and inclusion with these events. Um, so basically there has been like, we had this idea of uh, outreach and inclusion with the councils in the previous years and now with the assistance to the GB over the topic. Um, and I think it's quite a nice opportunity for NCs to try themselves out in, in the field of outreach and to try to have these inclusive events by organizing digital sessions for the people from remote areas or any other target group, other target group that they may have. Um, and I think that's something that all the NCs should kind of think about and try out the possibilities and possibly even um, organize outreach events online. Because, I mean, for, for all the obvious reasons of um, low cost or no cost at all, and just uh, being accessible for people who live wherever and who are coming from any possible backgrounds. And yeah, I mean, to me, at least, that's very interesting. Hmm. Also, one advantage we haven't really covered yet is um, that it's good for the environment in a way. Um, I mean, it's not emission free. Um, video chatting costs us a lot of data, um, the internet, the servers, all that needs um, some kind of energy supply. Um, but I think still compared to regular session, it's um, really eco-friendly, especially because people don't travel. Yeah, I mean, I know that, uh, for instance, there, there have been many events who wanted to have like zero post-it sessions and stuff like that, which honestly to me seemed very scary and kind of challenging because I'm kind of an old school kind of person and I like to write that everything down in my notebook or wherever, just to have it written and not on like digital uh, format, which is interesting, but still. Um, I think that, well, for this session we had like Miro and Ural, which are the platforms we use for committee work specifically that offer you this uh, opportunity or platform to have committee rooms and whiteboards uh, online. And basically like with the po post-its and with everything you can imagine to have in your regular committee work room, you can have it 
on this platform. So if you're applying, let's say, the Disney method, and if you have want to have like different corners of the room, you can still have it on the platform, which to me was quite interesting. And as Chris said, you can go kind of emission free if you don't print the certificates, the stickers, postcards, <laughs> and if we don't uh, use our laptop so much. Yeah, we've got words of praise from the sustainability um, pioneer herself, Nora Wilhelm, who organized LOX as well. So that was very good to see that because it, it was really um, beneficial for everyone to like limit the use of paper and, you know, not flying everywhere. So thank you for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, shall we move to the next uh, yes. slide? Yes. Um... So now we're moving into the Q&A section. So now you can basically submit questions. Um, you also have the possibility to vote questions that already have been submitted. So in case somebody has already asked what you wanted to ask, just vote it up. And the more upvotes it has, the earlier it's gonna be shown. So we're basically gonna be covering the most voted questions um, in a way. Uh, to submit your question, if you didn't get a little button, you can just refresh the page on Menti and you will be able to submit one. Okay, um, so we've got the first question already. If you could do it again, what would you do differently? Um, I think considering the session or the format itself, not much, to be honest. I think the only main difference would be the timeline. So the time you have in advance of the session should be longer for most official teams. Um, from an organizational perspective, it was already difficult for the media team and academic team impossible, nearly impossible. I mean, they managed, but it was, it was close to being impossible. Um, so next time to have more time pre in preparation. I think the, the session itself, I wouldn't do anything differently. Um, so let's move to the next one. Which were the tasks of organizers? Um, so we had tasks that you would have at regular sessions, delegate support, official support. Then we have platform administrators. So one organizer being responsible for one platform. Um, the platforms we used mainly were Discord, Zoom, and um, Kialo. Kiala was used for online debating during General Assembly. Um, then the, the center, the heart of the session was Discord. So that was where all the participants communicated and got in touch with each other. And then Zoom was mainly used for General Assembly and committee work. Um, then we had organizers for PR, um, internal communication, external communication. Um, I think that mainly covers it. Um, if you want to find it out in more detail, it's written down in the booklet we've published, how we divided structures. How do you deal with a participant that is quite shy to speak in an online platform? How do you run a complete, complete inclusive committee work? I think that's for Stefan. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Well, generally speaking, I wasn't as involved as I would normally be with the um, chairs because I mean it was hard to kind of have everyone covered like all the committee committees covered but what we try to do is the same as we would do um, at regular EYP events uh, or trying to include everyone because I mean for, for obvious reasons but uh, so for the for the platforms as I mentioned briefly Miro and Mural um, Chris are, are we do we want to, no, yeah, there's no need to show the platforms. I'm just used to our session still of showing people um, the platforms, but basically it's super simple because once you access the platform, um, you input your name, your username, whatever you want to, and you're free to do basically whatever you want to um, at those uh, platforms. So basically what happened with the committees is that we had uh, Zoom rooms for every committee um, where all the delegates were there, um, including the chairperson. And then we had one spot reserved for a member of the board who was uh, 
because we circulated among those Zoom rooms, just taking care of everyone and making sure everyone is supported. And basically, yeah, thank you. So that's like, a, like the thing you can see now on the screen is how it looks um, when it's zoomed in, but basically you can zoom out indefinitely and you can literally have it look like a committee room. And basically the delegates, they would uh, discuss things on a platform such as Discord or Zoom or Skype, wherever, but I think everyone used those Zoom rooms. And then they use those other platforms um, for just mapping out their ideas and anything basically related to their topics. Mm, how many unforeseen disasters did you face? Um, so we didn't have any major disasters, I would say. Um, the biggest problem issue was probably the live stream of the digital Euro concert. The problem was there that we had some copyright issues. Um, so there was one performance with the Michael Jackson song and we, we like everything was recorded in advance. The video was uploaded to Facebook. Then we used the live streaming option. It wasn't really live streaming. It was more a pre-recorded video and Facebook immediately blocked at minute 20 where that performance of Michael Jackson came up. And then it was blocked nearly everywhere around the world. Um, so we had to improvise and what we did was um, that I shared my screen um, on a big Zoom meeting with all the participants and then they were still able to continue um, watching Euroconcert. So I think um, it wasn't a major issue, but it was something that came up. And also sometimes you have those tiny issues where you have technical issues such as Zoom not functioning or that you can't enter the meeting, that the meeting ID has changed, the link has changed, stuff like that. But it's only minor stuff. I, we, we didn't face any disasters. No. Stefan? Uh, just from my side. Um, I mean, for the media, uh, it was, since we didn't, we weren't there physically when something went south with quality, uh, you couldn't reshoot it. So you relied on things people submitted to you and within such as short time frames, certain things needed to be cut, uh, whether it was due to um, the lack of time, free time during the session from the participant side if they needed to record anything, or um, just in general, maybe some shyness because it, it's a bit more difficult to um, activate the shyer people to participate in like a very group project and people tend to forget stuff. So uh, certain projects were scrapped just due to a low amount of submissions or to poor quality. If I may add, like from a technical standpoint, standpoint is that things went surprisingly well. I mean, the digital uh, environment completely eliminated all the technical issues you may have with hard drives, USBs, SD cards, uh, batteries dying, cameras not working. I was sincerely a bit um, worried about like drive uploading and downloading big files, but everything went completely fine. So from a technical standpoint, uh, I'm positively surprised of the, of the outcome. But again, as Katrina said on the projects, uh, there have been a capability. Yeah. If I can just add one thing before, before we move on, as Chris briefly mentioned, the technical difficulties. So, I mean, uh, the thing is, especially because of the timeline, but it's very important when you organize this event um, is to teach people and to, to make sure that everyone from the, well, from my side, the chairs team uh, knows how to use all the platforms, especially for the platforms that we use throughout, like mostly throughout the day, such as Zoom. So like in the beginning, we had some issues where we would continue to use, uh, well, the accounts that we were given to. And then if the organizers wanted to schedule some other activities such as the evening ones or for tomorrow, then we would have chairperson dropping out of the call. And there was a bit of uh, confusion on that side. But I mean, the takeaway would be to just make sure that everyone knows how to properly use, um, well, Zoom, Discord, Slack, whatever platform you opt to use in the future sessions. But uh, again, timeline and just like the amount of information we needed to soak in in those 10 days or nine days of working together was just extremely big. So then um, it was kind of difficult to, you know, talk about everything basically. 
What has been the feedback from first time delegates and their wish to attend a future physical event? Um, I think I can't like specifically answer the question. What I can tell you is we, we asked people if they would like to attend a digital event in future. Um, out of the officials, all of them, so all 40 officials have said they would do such an event in future again. Um, out of the delegates, 90% said they um, would enjoy attending a second digital event. Um, I've seen many of them on the Zoom tonight as well. Um, so if you could quickly confirm that, that would be great. Um, but um, we haven't specifically looked for first timers. Um, so I couldn't tell you the ratio of first timers. Um, the, the main criticism they had was the lack of physical contact. Um, but then it's just impossible to um, solve. So can't really do anything about that. Uh, did the chess team notice an increased agreeability or lack of heated debates in the committees or during GA? Wait, I'm doing something with our pictures. I'm not sure what's happening. It's fine. Yeah, um, well, it didn't feel as heated as it would feel probably at uh, regular UAP events. But the thing is, we, I, at least from my perspective, we managed to have more points than we usually would because what we did with the GA is that we had, so we had this debate separated in two sections. One was five minutes long and the other one was 10 minutes long. The five minute one was the silent debate where um, like all the delegates would uh, comment and raise points on any part of uh, the operative clauses on Kialo, which is a platform that Chris mentioned in the beginning we use for the GA. And basically they would write points while the uh, proposing committee would have uh, just they would literally discuss on Discord about the points and getting ready for the open debate that lasted for 10 minutes, where they had the opportunity to respond to all the points made um, during the silent debate. And then, of course, in those 10 minutes of open debate, the delegates, other delegates, also had the possibility of um, raising more points, um, well, on Kialo as well. And I think that was quite interesting because what we usually do during debates is that there's one person who, who's already in charge to reply to all the points, but in this way, they all kind of worked together and talked over Discord um, and helped each other kind of prepare better answers to the questions during the debate. So for me, it was much more constructive. And I think like if, if let's say I wanted to reply to some points, I would have the floor or the board would provide me with the floor, then I would reply, then Katarina could um, reply as well then Chris and then if I remembered something else I could again raise my hand be recognized by the board and then provide more ideas and answer to some points so I think it was much more constructive in a sense that I think it went like it was more detailed if you would because then if I reply to something then uh, others could comment on my ideas additionally on Kialo as well and then we would develop um, everything further. So for me, it was much, much more interesting than it would be. And yeah, also for the agree agreeability and stuff like that. So on Kialo, thank you, Chris. Um, on Kialo, you can also kind of um, rate ideas. So basically, if I say something, you can rate my idea. Yeah, as you can see, um, there is the bar that Chris is pointing to, and you can rate it from zero to four if you agree with me or if you completely disagree with me. So it was interesting to compare kind of how people think and just to, yeah, I mean, to rate all the ideas and questions uh, they may have for the proposing committee in such a way. And also for, for Kialo, I think, well, the platform is set up in such a way that it stops spamming or spam, whatever, where if um, everyone asks the same question, the platform would block the question and we would only have one of the instances of the questions being asked. And also if there's, uh, well, I mean, some inappropriate language, the platform would also take care of that. I mean, also, yeah, we had Chris and other organizers who were, who, who were kind of backing that up in case something was missed by the platform, but I, generally speaking, everything went um, very well and interesting to me uh, with using this platform. Yeah, I think it's really important to emphasize that was probably the most interactive, most, 
engaging debate, most engaging GA in a way. Um, as you can see, for instance, here, that's just one example debate I opened right now. That was the committee on econ and 92 people submitted points. Um, so they made 92 points to this whole resolution in total, um, which is unthinkable in the format of open debate, such um, like we have at regular sessions, because then one debate would take three hours. But here, all this was done in 15 minutes. Um, and the committee even had the chance to reply for a full 10 minutes. So most of the points were covered. Um, so I really liked that new approach to GA. Um, and even though I wasn't really participating as head organizer, um, I was actively listening all day and it was really interesting to follow along. Um, yeah. Something I usually not really experience if I'm not debating myself. Yeah, and also um, for, for the GA, I mean, the only difficulty kind of the board faced was that, well, on Zoom, not everyone had their name written as Stefan Downscore or whatever, E-Tray or whatever. So it was kind of hard to keep track of who we are giving our like the points to because we had those uh, proposition speeches like a text speech or whatever. And it was kind of hard for us to keep track on that. So like if you're planning to organize an event or if you're planning to yeah, do whatever with this uh, form of GA, basically like number one tip would be to have people rename themselves in their name and the community they're coming from because that way it's much easier to follow because at some point like at, at times it was very confusing especially if you are kind of moderating the discussion by giving a uh, floor to people because there's this option raise hand on zoom it was kind of hard to to keep track of who uh use the the function raise hand who you need to mute who you need to give the floor to and stuff like that so just change the name to your committee and your name and we should be good to go in the future. Okay, so um, just how we're gonna proceed now is that um, we're gonna be answering a lot more questions for the next five minutes. Then there's gonna be a small surprise from the international office, a small video that we're gonna be showing. Um, after that, you are free to go if you have any other responsibilities, because we initially scheduled this meeting until seven, but you are more than welcome to stay and we're gonna, well, answer questions as long as there are new questions coming, as long as people are interested, basically. Um, so let's see how far we get in those five minutes, then the video and then more questions. Um, how do you guarantee the delegates' engagement throughout the session? Um, so from an organizational perspective, just make everything as engaging and interactive as possible. Um, one thing we did was adding delegates early to the Discord, so everyone had the chance to get to know each other one week in advance of the session. I think that greatly helped. That was some kind of informal team building and then we just made sure that all the activities we do are exciting. So whenever we felt something, okay, that would be boring, that's difficult to realize, that's not really interesting, we just skipped it. Um, we had morning program, which was really interesting for some delegates where they had sports to get energized in the morning. We had a lot of optional evening program. So they also had time to bond without the official program. And um, during the program, obviously, um, the chairs did a lot. Maybe, Stefan, you could comment on that. Yeah, so, like, another thing that I want to mention is what Valeria and Helena shared with us, like, before the session. So when we, when we were thinking about the size of committees, we found that seven is, like, well, the perfect number of people to have in the committee, to have everyone um, engaged, because if we have more than it will be kind of harder for us to coordinate everyone and to allow everyone to speak. So it wouldn't be as productive. And um, well, generally how what we try to do with engaging people is as Chris said, we added the delegates uh, before the event on Discord and the chairs had several days, what several days, like three to four days before the session to get to know each other with the delegates and just to start preparing everything. And like for, the time I spent in, in, in committee rooms or on Zoom rooms, um, it was, it was kind of natural to be honest, because I mean, as we usually would have different types of delegates and different types of people generally talking, uh, 
the flow seemed, I think, more natural than it would be um, in, in committee rooms because people were kind of just unmuting themselves and talking and it, it was, it just seemed natural from that perspective. And obviously like the chairs played a very big role in that of just moderating discussions and taking care of everyone and seeing uh, that um, everyone is speaking more or less the same and other stuff like that, that we usually do um, for committee for committees. And from the media side, uh, delegate engagement was actually very specific at the session. Uh, since we were focusing a lot on internal communication as well for the delegates to have fun. So we had projects such as challenges uh, throughout the day or daily challenges that uh, by a media team member where they would have been given a prize if they got the most reactions for it. It proved to be quite lovely. We especially had like a very, very um, successful challenge of the day, which was the Getty Museum challenge where people recreated paintings um, with objects they had around the house. Um, we're currently curating that so that we can post it and share it somewhere, but it was it was really lovely and it turned into like a little art history lesson. Same with people cooking and it was just a, a, a very nice sense of community uh, that surprised us, uh, to say the least. Yeah, about that, like two things uh, that I think were fundamental in keeping them engaged was the fact that we had dedicated channel for this project so that we didn't get lost in the noise of all the other communications. There was a big project that was uh, a puzzle story that had its own dedicated channel just for the project. Um, and another factor was keeping uh, the same format in the sense that the challenges were posted every day at the same time of the day so that the delegates knew where it went to um, chime in. And the fact that we always try to add an element of novelty inside the format. Uh, going back to what Valeria said, the beginning uh, creativity must be bound. Uh, and so <clears throat> giving ourselves this format in which to operate, we try to change stuff around to give this incentive to, to participate. Um, I believe, as we can see right now, it worked very, very well. We're super happy with the results. Mm, all right. Um, so now it's five to seven, um, as promised. We're going to be showing the video, and then there's going to be a small announcement um, by the international office. Um, and as you prepare it, I can maybe already, but you can already prepare it, Chris. Um, this is exciting news, and it's a very big secret. And now you are the first people to know. Thank you. Um, you saw it yourself. There will be a digital health forum happening in summer and the international office, AKA us, we will be launching a call for the head organizer, the president and the editor or editors um, very, very soon. So while on one hand, if you're present here on behalf of your NC and your NC is thinking about going ahead with doing some things online, please go for it. There is uh, uh, the international office, we will support you with any resources you would need. There is a Zoom account that you can request if you need anything else, feel free to drop me an email and say, we are thinking about doing this. We are not sure. We would be happy to consult you and give you anything. But uh, on top of that, we also want to make sure that such a cool innovation keeps on going with how we can reform the format of sessions and adapt it to online in such a international context. And we want to give an opportunity to people that are excited to try it out um, to feature this health topic this summer. So I hope some of you will apply. <laughs> okay, um, so let's head back to the questions as promised. How did you keep the participants focused so long per day on Zoom? 
Um, so for GA, we definitely did that by reforming the structure. Um, as we said, we had the debates on Kialo, which made it a lot more engaging. Um, we had several breaks in between, um, a long lunch break for nearly one hour, uh, small coffee breaks in between, like you would have at regular sessions. And um, also a lot more people had the opportunity to speak because we had more speeches. Um, Stefan? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, the breaks helped us a lot because then the chairs could have, well, they could plan the team building activities and committee work methods according to the schedule. So basically, because what was different than it was at regular or at the events I visited in the past is that, like, nearly everyone respected those breaks because, like, it, like the delay was minimal to none, basically. And then we would have, like, a half like half or an hour and a half of uh well committee work and then a 15 minute break and then another um like time slot for committee work so it was kind of it was easy at least for my side to focus on that because like it just felt easier and more like well how do you how, what's the word um loose oh <laughs> yeah it was comfortable. it was much more comfortable and chill to do it in that environment than to 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 be like in regular committee work rooms. I mean, it was in the end, I think only six hours of day that we um, required delegates to um, invest per per yeah per day basically. Um, so I think it was it was fine. It was maybe even not as much as I wanted to have. But still, I think we managed to cover um, everything in those six hours because we had so such breaks. Also, one thing I don't I don't know if we mentioned it or not, but generally speaking, with the digital session format, what was also really good for the participants, uh, I mean, feedback-wise, what we've gotten is that it was a lot easier for people with social anxiety or just general shyness to speak up and be a bit more comfortable with their environment. Um, so that was um, an incredibly fulfilling thing to see people write about it. Did you have any problem with time zones? Um, no, not really, um, because we always clearly communicated, especially in the beginning. Towards the end, we didn't have to anymore, but especially in the beginning, we always communicated, okay, this is the official schedule in CEST. And if you live in a different time zone, please check accordingly. And I think we emphasized that five or 10 times. And afterwards, everyone understood, okay, if it says 10 on the schedule, that's 12 in my time zone. Yeah, so and also, I think one of the organizers uh, shared the time zone converter of on Discord in at the beginning of the session, so it was kind of easy easy to uh, keep track of everything. And I know that we had one participant from Singapore um, that we were lucky enough because they're like in plus uh, from us. But like from my perspective, I would be kind of scared to have people from like America or whatever because I mean it would be super early for them to start. Yeah, we had a delegate from Brazil and one more from yeah uh, exactly. So I guess for the people coming from that part of the world, it would be kind of too early to wake up at like 4 a.m. to start committee work. But, um, well, it, I, we didn't hear any complaints or problems. No, like as far as I've heard, they still enjoyed the session very much and just their sleeping schedule was a bit off, but it was perfectly fine in the end. <laughs> um, did you think about data protection while choosing the platforms? Um, yes, we did, um, as far as we could. Um, so, I mean, obviously you could be really strict on data protection and be like only use services that are hosted in Europe, um, which I don't think is a feasible option, to be honest. Um, if you go as strict, you probably have no choices left because, um, most of the players on the market right now are from America, Zoom, Discord. I think like literally all the platforms we used are larger American companies. Um, so if you were to go as strict, he probably wouldn't have any choices left or would be really, really hard. And, um, but of course, um, 
whenever we collect the data, we asked for permission and we also, um, yeah, respected the data protection laws. And the only concern you could voice is that we used um, international services, so not only European. Uh, question for the media team. How can you manage doing memories for participants like photos and videos of the session? Screen recording interviews, it say, basically, isn't it said to have beautiful photos? Um, well, we mentioned that we didn't do photography, but with the challenges that we, I mean, our media team members did a really good job of monitoring, uh, not monitoring, sorry, documenting um, what participants have done throughout the sessions and with challenges such as like share your daily snack or something or with the art um, challenge or with a fitness challenge people were like creating conversations there's there's still documentation on the platform as well um but as far as projects when we didn't do much screen recording be because we did feel as if it was a bit intrusive um especially with committee work and team building since most of the the games were get to know each other games so screen recording those would be a bit off from our side um so we tried to keep focusing on the internal communication aspect so that they created conversation and memories of their own um with our permission with their uh, permission for us to use any sort of data that they provided us with another thing i think is very important to underline is that the projects were not something that came from uh, the, the media team members, but again, was something that was created by the participants themselves. And so uh, I think that having those gives the participants a greater feeling of ownership of the session and of, of the end product itself. It's sort of like being able to take this, the committee flag away with you at all, in a sense. Um, so I don't want to share too much about the projects we, we, we have in store because uh, I mean, that would ruin the surprise. But I believe like from the memories part, I believe we largely achieved that uh, again with this product that delegates made themselves most. It's also coming back to like the new age of media's, uh, media teams and new IPs that again, we're not there to archive stuff and be uh, a reporter, but more so we're here to uh, moderate and emulate a good interaction for the delegates. Cause again, it's something they should be a part of and not something that is served to them. Um, so with this session, it has shown that they were very eager to participate with stuff. And it was lovely to see their creative side as well with child, with a project um, uh, of a media team member of ours uh, called Puzzle Story, where they each had to form a sentence and they formed a really nice story. So um, yeah, regarding that, they had a lot of creativity and I'm pretty sure that memories have been kept yeah, I think that's also the great advantage of having one central platform, which was Discord in our case, because um, the platform itself is completely for free. You have unlimited history. So it's not as in Slack where messages just magically disappear after some time, um, but they are still all here. Um, especially um, there's also committee channels. So each committee had their own channel. Um, I think that's really important for the delegates that they had their safe space, but also a lot of memories attached to that one channel. Um, then there's the more public channels, which the media team mainly use um, to do some projects. Um, and just everything is still there. Like even the announcements, you can still check the program. You can, everything is still there. So if you want to see it, you can always join and find out. So the the documentation is there by itself, basically. If I can just two things about the channels, is something that uh, Kevin and I tried to implement from the very beginning, and I think it's very useful for anyone who wants to approach this kind of session, is to think as a channel as a physical space, because when communication is instantaneous there, it's very much like a physical space. Um, and it's something that came up when, with uh, Stefan earlier, uh, the importance that everyone knows uh, how to use the platform because again if you think of it as a physical space it's as if the delegate wouldn't know how to open the door or how to communicate properly pro uh, properly in that room um, and so something i noted from the workload was the inclusivity aspect and the communication aspect 
And so having everyone in that same room uh, uh, is actually very beneficial to the project we brought forward because we could access every delegate uh, at the same time. Um, and from the communication side, it, even though at times it could have been messy when everyone wrote in the same exact moment, there were uh, ways to control that. Uh, Chris and Georgas were very useful with their knowledge of the platform of that. Um, and so I think the, the big shift when approaching this sort of session is to uh, think of it as a proper space, in a sense, even though it's of course in time to move. But, yeah. mm. Would you change anything regarding well-being of participants, uh, particularly for screen times, etc.? Um, so one thing that came to my mind only after the session is basically like even though the session happens digitally, um, I think that it could be, for instance, during committee work, certain hours where you don't necessarily need to look at the screen, where you only work by voice. Um, because most of the time, I mean, right now we have the Zoom meeting, you can see everyone. Um, but then again, is it really necessary to see everyone? Is it necessary to look at the screen right now? Because all I'm looking at is my background picture. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say is um, you can also reduce screen time by actively avoiding a screen because nothing speaks against still using your old school notebook while you're at the computer um, where you would work here and then not have the direct screen contact. Um, but I think generally speaking, well-being was cared about a lot um, as we mentioned earlier, the official mandatory slots were only between 10 and 16. So only six hours a day with one hour of a lunch break and I think half an hour um, coffee breaks. Um, before and after that, there was optional morning and evening program, but that was totally up to the participants. Um, so we never checked on anyone if people were tired or wanted to get off the computer, that was perfectly fine. Um, and even for the mandatory um, events such as Euroconcert, I mean, obviously we didn't go there and check if everyone is present. If you're just tired and exhausted from the day, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, we also had one person especially dedicated to well-being. Um, so big shout out. Um, that was helpful as well. And um, I would definitely recommend that. Um, I think you can get in touch with Veronica um, or the whole BNC working group that works on well-being, if you're interested in more stuff. Um, were there any privacy concerns, especially with the problems Zoom had, or even just participants taking unfortunate screenshots? Um, so there is no way of preventing people to take screenshots. There is just no technical way. Um, so people can always take screenshots. Um, and what they also, what participants agreed to when they initially signed up for the session was that um, we're going to be recording some parts of it and that we have the permission to use the screenshots. And I think we always emphasize during all program points that if you're doing something, like let's say I'm eating or I'm doing something I'm not comfortable with having myself on the screen, um, just turn off your camera and that's perfectly fine. Um, there were no privacy issues with the Zoom because um, first of all, they updated all their structure and we always had protected meetings, which meant um, you could only access if you had the meeting ID and the password, um, which is <clears throat> sort of impossible to hack. Um, yeah. Was this an IS? Um, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> It was um, the first of its kind, first uh, digital international session, um, which is shown by the participants, I think. Um, it was as international as an international session. We had Euro concerts, we had all the aspects an international session had. Um, so why not? I would say totally yes. Um, but you can discuss that with your, the international office, I think. <laughs> yeah, we might disagree because it was the. <laughs> And I guess there is a whole selection procedure with the governing body and there's a lot of things. This was a very international session, but not the international session that Milano, for example, of Warsaw is. Um, was spam in the channels a big problem? Um, no, not as far as I know. 
in the very beginning, we had some issues with people texting in a really special way. So instead of putting one sentence, they would submit several words, line three words, line three words. Um, so what we tried to do was to remind them just send one message if you want to say something and want to say one thing and that um, was fine. Um, we also set up the official um, welcome and rules on Discord and I think generally speaking that worked um, quite fine. And then you still have some options which would limit participants from spamming. So you can also set time limits, you can temporarily ban people. We never did that, we never had to, um, but in theory you can. Um, and you could also set time limits. So you could say like only one message every five minutes, or something like that. So spamming isn't really an issue per se. How did the board support chairs when they couldn't be present in the committee room? Um, I mean, first of all, they could be, but um, Stefan? Yeah, so what uh, like we try to do is that because Zoom uh, has the limit of 10 people in the room, we always made sure that the everyone from the board is rotating in uh, visiting committees and we had a spreadsheet to kind of clock in when we enter the room as we would probably at a regular events by putting a post-it or something like that. So um, what I try to do, but honestly this didn't feel as natural as it would in real life. I uh, texted my chairs um, several times during the day to check whether everything is going according to their plan, to uh, check if they need anything, if they have any concerns. So I think in a sense, it was much easier to support them because I was always available to them um, on Discord, Facebook, and any other platforms we used. And basically I regularly texted them to check whether they need anything from my side. And then we, I think at all times, we had at least one member of the board um, in one of the rooms because it was four of us. So like we didn't cover um, obviously all 10 committees at the same time. But we, we, of course, gave them space uh, where they needed more space, where we uh, shouldn't in, intervene or just, or we didn't intervene at all because we were muted and we didn't have our cameras turned on most of the times. But um, it was reg like, as it would regularly happen, we have had a rotation and I also communicated with the chairs um, through Discord. And also in the evening, we had um, our chairs meetings on uh, Skype where we kind of briefed each other um, on what has happened and when where the chairs had the platform to kind of ask any questions both to the board and to other chairpersons what, if they need some help with uh, some practices, ideas on how to tackle certain issues. So from my perspective and from what I've heard from the chairs, it went uh, very well, but uh, it just, it didn't feel the same as it would if I asked someone at a session like, hey, do you need any help, how are you doing with things? Because it was kind of through keyboard and the feeling wasn't there, but I was still available to everyone at all times. And also great advantage is that you can just switch rooms easily. So you don't have to rush from different venues or different rooms, but you, it's one click and you're in the next room. And I think it's also less disturbing because you don't really open the door, come in, everybody looks at you. As someone who is thinking of sharing at a digital session, how does the process differ and what are some challenges I should expect? Yeah, um, well, the main difference is that there is no physical touch. Um, but as we mentioned uh, several times so far, we added the delegates before the session on Discord. So then the chairpersons had more time to kind of uh, do the team building activities with uh, delegates not like in a regular way of playing games and doing our team building activities, but just of getting to know each other because they would have their private channels on Discord where the chairperson was, um, if they wanted to do that, but they all did, um, was to start communicating with people, getting to know each other as we would usually do uh, with the official team, for example. So once we select the chair team, let's say on Slack, we kind of have the introductions and we slowly start working together um, on the session. So it's the same um, principle we applied for the committees here. Um, and then 
as I mentioned, well, the, the, the thing that kind of differ is that for team building, you rely on um, platforms online. So ob obviously for name games, um, getting to know each other and stuff like that, it's pretty simple. But then from the problem solvers, um, it's kind of different because basically you, in a way, play a game with everyone, like a multiplayer game on, a, on like a platform. For instance, we had escape rooms and there were some other games um, in the handbook that we utilized uh, to overcome that. So to me, that was different that, that what I'm used to because, I mean, we were playing games as a team building game, which we do, but it was just, um, I don't know, uh, challenging. Um, and that's one factor. But I think for committee work, um, it's much different than, um, much different challenges are uh, present than during the team building because it's, kind of discussion takes less time from you digitally because you can type, you can use other tools and platforms that the chairs used to communicate. But then there's also like, those things are also written in the handbook. So you can kind of um, like, well, learn about it and prepare in advance. So I don't think it was that challenging for the chairs. I mean, I can see some of my chairs here on the platform, hi Ocean. Um, I mean, Chris, if you, we can give him um, the floor to kind of share his impressions real quick, that would be lovely. If he wants to, yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, um, it was really interesting for me, definitely, chairing. I found that it was a lot more necessary to be, to be prepared because the time went by really quick and you kind of were always in front of the screen and you always had to be there and communicating so that you didn't have time to just like let delegates discuss and go make your plans for the next part it was really beneficial to have a clear structured plan and also to know what parts you can cut if you do lose time because typically five minutes before and after every every break some delegates would have to leave early or some would come back late so it was important to concentrate the main part you wanted to achieve in the center of the work then also, I found that even if you're in front of a computer screen, it was really beneficial to like communicate positively and to make sure that you're smiling because they, delegates pick up on that definitely through the screen, even if they're not there with you in person. And that, yeah, it was more important to kind of, I think this was covered in the booklet, that calling on people by name and kind of directly addressing them was a lot more beneficial for addressing any issues or if you wanted to get someone to talk that the silence technique, but whereby you just kind of allow an awkward silence until someone wants to talk was not as effective, but that people were generally very good at including each other. And apart from that, yeah, I'd say it's best to make use of the interactivity the internet offers. It offered a lot of advantages, nearly more than disadvantages, I would say. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also just another thing to mention before, uh... Oh yeah, they definitely notice your smile, Ocean. That's what Adam said. Um, yeah, another thing that I wanted to mention is that, I mean, you can see the resolution booklet on, online and you can be the judge of its quality, but most of the committees were done with uh, the resolutions much before, um, well, the deadline, let's, let's call it like that, because like we didn't, like we wouldn't lose time on going back from like a venue to, um, well, from a, like a school or whatever to hotel, hostel or whatever. But people, if, even when the schedule was done, they had the platform to keep communicating and keep brainstorming the ideas on Discord and stuff like that. So I think it was, it, it was kind of natural, um, at least from what I've seen on Discord. Um, and yeah, that's it. I shouldn't talk for so long. How do you ensure commitment by participants, especially for such a long time? Um, I think we've covered that question. How did you ensure individual individual approach during CGO trainings? Should I start? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, so the, the board conducted a needs analysis uh, for our team um, where we would, we kind of asked, not kind of, we asked the chairs to kind of tell us um, uh, what they're struggling with and what their concern their concerns are for 
um, the session, as in, as everyone mentioned, the team building, committee work structures and stuff like that online. And then um, we had the trainings on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, it was like two, two trainings per day, plus uh, training for online platforms um, that was added on day two, um, where we literally simulated the CGO day, but in, in free time slots. And then additionally, um, I, as the president, scheduled one-on-one -on -one meetings with the chairs team, where I went through their plans with them and just personally um, checked and helped them tailor their work for the days, uh, for the upcoming days. Um, so then let's say if Ocean, uh, yeah, not let's say, but he was always prepared for every part of um, the session. And then he would send me uh, his document with his plans and he would ask any questions if he had any concerns. And then we would kind of discuss it over Skype and just, I would make sure and the board would make sure that everyone is kind of uh, comfortable with doing all the activities they planned and that there are no any questions or uncertainties about their plans. How would one digital session change from another? Um, I think there's many ways you can change or spice up the format. Um, I mean, I think it will just happen naturally, like at regular EYP sessions, because literally what we do in every national committee is it's always more or less the same program but still sessions feel completely differently. Um, so right now with EYP Turkey sort of doing the first national session, um, I'm quite sure that they're gonna add some parts to it, which sort of also represent the Turkish NC or the Turkish mentality of organizing things. Um, I think this first one was quite German accurate, strictly organized. Um, maybe the ones in future are more free flow and let's have fun um i mean we also have fun <laughs> not, not not saying that <laughs> it was fun <laughs> it was a lot of fun sorry yeah i mean also what we briefly mentioned before if you make it an outreach event then you can focus on getting delegates only for from remote areas of your country uh which again would be completely different uh, from what we had at this event. Especially with media, like projects different from session to session is with Orthodox um, events. So of course, like since the format is so new, there's a lot more stuff to do with it since it's a first of its kind thing. Yeah, I think that something that would uh, really change the digital session a lot would be all the different platforms that started already come up during the this first weeks of, of coronavirus uh, lockdown and all the ones that are going to come up for, for online work and using different modes of online interactivity uh, will add a lot to what a digital session can be. And I think, um, and, and it'd be like nice to hear what Chris may think about this. I think something that would be also interesting to, to, to see how that goes would be maybe uh, changing the format slightly. Um, like because the, this first one was very, very similar to um, the standard session time-wise. It was, uh, wasn't really full time, but it was uh, in a defined time frame. And I believe that maybe like as time goes on, uh, we, we could like try changing uh, again. For example, the CJO for us as well didn't happen in just one day, but in, in two different days. Um, so I believe it's a trade-off um, between the feeling of being there and the ability to like balance that with your free from your with your normal life maybe like the way that time is divided during days and I think like changing bit by bit experimenting with that could be one of the things that could change it to session. <clears throat> How to maximize the chance of a delegate to participate in a physical event after being present at the digital one? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understand the question, um, but I think the digital sessions are just as good um, as the regular ones. Um, so if a delegate would enjoy a regular session, they would enjoy a digital session, most of them. Um, 
so I think they would also be highly encouraged to join a normal event after they've taken part in the digital one, or even more. Um, do you plan to have a physical event gathering all the participants of the digital session? Um, <laughs> not really as of right now. Um, I mean, we were joking about setting up a campsite in my garden. Um, not sure if that's going to happen anytime soon with the corona restrictions still being in place. Um, but yeah, um, I would be happy to do a reunion um, in Berlin, probably just because it's in the center of Europe. So it would be the easiest destination for most people to reach. Um, but yeah, I would definitely be up for it. Um, Chris, who was your favorite organizer of the session, except for yourself? Um, <laughs> I think I shouldn't answer those kind of questions. Um, all of them. Is there an increased level of digital skills required to be able to chair a committee online? Um, yes and no. I mean, not per se, but you really need to take some time to get into the platforms. Like you can't expect to just join the platform and immediately be able to do and understand everything. Yeah, I mean, if you ever played any game um, on Sony PlayStation or your laptop, whatever, um, well, it's kind of the same, but when you're showing it to your younger brother or sister or how to play the game, you kind of need to know what you're uh, dealing with and you need to know advantages and disadvantages of the platforms and games. So my suggestion for anyone who's planning to chair um, on a digital event would be to read the handbook and uh, read all the, well, the, the games we have in the spreadsheet. And if you have the time, uh, feel free to check them out, like the platforms for, for specific games because it's much easier and much more natural and comfortable for you to chair if you know what you're doing, because, I mean, obviously. Mm -hmm. Also to the question earlier, um, we just received a submission via the chat. Um, so apparently there are also people who prefer the digital format to regular sessions. Stefan, are you considering keeping the mustache? I think that's a yes. <laughs> that's a no. That's... How did you ensure that all delegates had the chance to speak up during GA and voice their opinion, since the board didn't recognize committees but specific people? Um, so I can just explain how it worked in theory. Um, there were 20 speeches to be allocated. Um, so in theory, each committee would have two speeches during GA. Um, additionally, each committee would also have the chance to speak during their own debate and then everybody would have the chance to speak, especially during the 10 minutes um, of open debate, which um, answered the questions um, they made on Kialo. So my personal feeling was that people had a lot more opportunities to speak, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, Stefan. Yeah, well, that's kind of true. But then, so if we have, we wanted to have 20 speeches um, allocated to two per committee, but since the idea of proposition speeches uh, was to have, uh, sorry, position speeches was to have one in favor and one against the resolution, then we would rely on one committee having, let's say, a one against and one for, or then two committees having two against and another committee had two for. So what we try, we try to balance it out with the position speeches but then uh, in addition to us relying on people uh, willing to allocate those speeches or to ask for those speeches in such a way, there was also the struggle that I mentioned in the beginning uh, with um, our Zoom thing was that people were named uh, either by their nicknames, their names, something random. Um, so it was kind of, not kind of, it was very hard to know uh, which committee a person is coming from. I mean, Chris provided the board with a uh, spreadsheet with all the names and um, like, yeah, the names of delegates and their committees, but then it was hard to type in each name, like in the finder and then to find it, to check from which committee it is because of the time restrictions. So for future GAs and future digital sessions, I think it's extremely important to ask uh, participants to rename themselves according um, to what the board 
uh, one. So basically for me, it would be the name of the person um, and then their committee, because in that way we can keep track on who's getting the points. And obviously uh, for all pro uh, proposing committees, every delegate has the opportunity uh, to, to, to speak up uh, in during debate. And I think every, I, not I think, I know, because I moderated uh, mostly like with the board, like yeah, whatever, but uh, we gave a floor to anyone who wanted to speak. Even if, if it lasted for more than 10 minutes, we would prolong um, the time for as much as everyone uh, needed for everyone to be able to share their ideas. So only the only problem were the position speeches because we couldn't know who we are giving the points to or which committees. Could you talk a bit more about my role, my role and the advantages and disadvantages? Me? <laughs> um, so I think like the biggest disadvantage we faced during the session was um, that the services are not 100% reliable. Um, so at some points people could simply not access what they had created on there which is honestly a problem. I mean, imagine you have this huge wall of brainstorming material, and then at some point you just can't access it. Um, that's definitely a problem. Um, but I think generally speaking, it offers a lot of advantages because it's a lot more flexible. You have a lot of different options to structure it. Um, people can work all at the same time in the same place. You don't really need to group stuff because you can group it while you're creating it. Um, but then again, I, I didn't really use those platforms because... I mean, both of those are kind of a tool for discussion because obviously um, all the delegates were talking on Zoom and brainstorming their ideas and just discussing everything. But then this was literally used as, um, well, not as a whiteboard, but like for any place you would normally use it during committee work uh, to group stuff, to uh, share ideas, to put useful links. And it was literally like a big, big, big knowledge bank where everything was divided in sections as in like knowledge bank, then uh, brainstorming ideas, um, whatever. So it was like a one place for everything. But then I, I remember that uh, one committee um, lost literally everything because I'm, I can't remember whether it was Miro or, or Mural, they had some maintenance to do uh, literally during the session. So that was a big, big disadvantage because they had to start over because they couldn't access anything they discussed so far. So then probably what I would suggest uh, everyone to do in the future would be to back up the ideas on some other platform like Google Drive or well in their notebook and then they can reshare it in the future if something like that happens but le then we cannot affect that and that's something that was completely uh, well uh, unplanned from our side <clears throat> why not slack um oh that's that's a really good question <laughs> i was waiting for that one a long time um it's really simple so first of all because this code is completely for free um you might think slack is free as well but it's not really, it's sort of, it has this catch to it. Um, so basically what happens usually is you start using Slack and then at the point you're really starting to use it, they want you to pay. Um, and that's, I mean, if you have the budget for that, then it's totally fine. You can um, use Slack, but um, I think if you want to go for a free version that remains free, and where you know you're still going to have access to the files two weeks later and they're not going to ask you to pay for it and then probably Discord is the place to go. Um, also, I personally like the interface a bit more. Some people prefer the interface of Slack. And um, another great advantage I can show you is um, the roles. Um, so here on the right, you can see that people are grouped into different roles. Um, so you can directly see who is who. Um, you can directly start talking to people and you have the voice channels, which you can just join in, talk and then leave again, um, which was greatly used during GA, for instance, um, that each committee had their own voice channel. And what they did was they had to communicate during the big Zoom where we had the GA. So they went into the voice channels and um, the great advantage is you only have voice there. So they could speak freely um, while also attending the GA. Um, 
those are the advantages I can think of right now. And also one more thing, you can easily copy the whole structure. Um, so it took us initially a lot of time to set this up, this whole structure, but right now we're also providing a template which allows you with one click to have exactly the same structure in place. And then um, also all the roles make sense already. So if you put someone in the role of AFCO, the only committee channel they can see is AFCO. So the, the whole thing makes sense. Yeah, I think I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Could you elaborate on the inclusivity aspect other than not having to travel? How was outreach done? Were any delegates from disadvantaged areas included? You also mentioned some disabled delegates. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so um, we asked them in advance if they have any disabilities or anything like that. Um, two people have come back to us. Um, sorry if I get the exact medical terms wrong. But um, one person was basically disabled in the wheelchair, so wasn't really able to move. So travel would be really difficult. And the other problem had some eyesight problems, which means I think the person could only see like 10% or something like that. Um, and I think that greatly helps if you have all the technology we have nowadays available, um, because if you don't need to move as much, um, or you can have something enlarged on the screen that probably makes it a lot easier to work than if you at a regular session need to read a post-it, but you can't read it because the font is too small. Um, <clears throat> we, we didn't focus on outreach. It more happened by accident. I think you could even focus more on outreach. Um, so geographic regions or something like that were not a selection criteria. Um, but we had to look where participants live and some of them live in really remote areas. Um, and then if you have this comparison, I think um, it's always harder to reach people in remote places. I hope that answers the question. Um, why was the limit 75 participants? So um, we well, we try to see what is the maximum you could take because from a digital perspective, there's no limit. I mean, it could have been 400, 500 participants, but then again, does it really make sense from a session and from a program perspective? Because if you have, like now with 75 people, we had 10 committees, half of them seven delegates, half of them eight delegates. Um, which is what we thought the perfect size for one committee. So we didn't want to make the committees any bigger, which would only have allowed us to have even more committees, but we felt like 10 is probably the maximum number we should have or that we can handle. Um, of course, this could potentially be expanded in future, but I think also the session itself would suffer a bit. Because right now with the size of the session, I have got the feeling that everyone had the chance to get to know everyone. Whereas what happens at international sessions usually is that you don't get to know half of the people. And only five years later, you find out, oh, you also attended that session. I didn't know. Um, and I think that's a shame. And especially for the online format, it's really important to know who you're speaking to, who's engaged. Um, who is with you, um, that's why we agreed on that number. How do you see digital sessions and format as a part of educational shift in EYP generally to see the bigger picture? Um, I mean, I think a lot of stuff we do in EYP can be done digitally. So it's not only about sessions, you can also have trainings. Um, I know that EYP Greece, for instance, did a full training weekend last weekend um, I was really impressed by that because it allows all people to participate. You have knowledge sharing. You also reach out to people that might have been not so active in the past, but now will become more active in future. And it's really inclusive. And also, if you don't have time for the full weekend, it doesn't really matter because you can just attend some of the workshops, the ones you're interested in, and then the rest of the weekend, you can do um, other things so i think there's great advantage um and also 
uh, someone uh, mentioned the external speakers slash trainers. I think going digital is also a very good opportunity for MCs to uh, seek trainers for their members uh, from their country that are experts in some field that uh, wouldn't be able to, let's say, travel to like a remote city or wherever they are holding their trainings, but rather now they're online, they can access the Zoom room and they can hold the trainings, uh, the training for an hour and a half or something, which is a very good opportunity, a learning opportunity for the members as well. And if I could also add something to this question, I think now that so many, um, everything educational has moved online, I think this event is a great show to how engaging, like truly engaging UAP format is. Because of course, if you would compare with the responses of people just sitting on lectures versus what happened in the committee work, it just shows you that there are great advantages to the format that we have. And in this current situation, it's a, it's a high time for us to, to use it. Um, could you elaborate on the platforms used ups and downs? Um, I'm going to keep this very brief, um, but basically we use Zoom because you have the bigger rooms. Um, Skype would offer a similar functionality, but then again, you couldn't see as many people at the same time. And also it's not as crash resistant, I would say. Um, so Zoom has just the reliability aspect. Um, then for communication, I already explained why we prefer Discord over Slack or any other messaging platform. Um, one advantage I haven't really mentioned yet is that Discord is something really distinct. So not many people have it. Um, I think most of the people only sign up for Discord for this session. So they also sort of relate the platform to the session itself. Um, which is good because you don't really have any disturbance from the outside. Um, I mean, to give a silly example, um, we could also have used a big WhatsApp group chat, but then it would have been really disturbing because obviously there's a lot of other stuff going on there. But Discord is usually only used for gaming. And um, I think many people didn't use it before. So it was sort of their space where they wouldn't get distracted. And if they want to participate in the session, they would just open Discord and that would basically be the session for them. Um, and then Kialo, it was just the best tool that we found for GA. Um, I think it offers the most advantages. And as of now, I also don't really know a platform that is comparable or any better. Was managing and shuffling to so many digital platforms a problem? Um, no, I wouldn't say so, because we emphasized from the very beginning that Discord is at the heart, at the center, that everything starts and ends there. And it, I mean, it's like the accommodation in a regular session. You would know, okay, in the morning you wake up there, in the evening you go to sleep there. And that was sort of true for the Discord as well. Um, and then if we switch to other platforms, that was always explained and we just gave people access and I think that worked fine. Did you have any problems with people not familiar with technology confused with platforms? Not really. We provided um, instructions for other platforms. So like small booklets explaining how to do everything. And um, yeah, that turned out very helpful. And we also had the support channel on Discord um, where we um, would answer technical questions. Aside from getting into Zoom room, Zoom's account data rule. Okay, so it's again about Zoom and data protection. Um, still, it was the um, best platform available. And um, I think it still <laughs> was an advantage to have used it. Um, but if you know any better platforms, um, always feel free to suggest them. Um, I can also add them into the booklet for future digital sessions. Yeah, I mean, all the platforms and ideas uh, we shared in the booklet are not kind of set in stone, but uh, that's something we did. Um, most of the, the 
most of those are suggestions for people who have no clue where to start with planning an event that like, like this one. And this is like, a, well, a first step for them to, to learn about it and to prepare for that. And of course, as Chris mentioned, like, I mean, obviously, if you know of better, better platforms, I think everyone would love to, to hear about it. Um, and then we can teach people uh, to have the session more secure um, and more private by using better platforms uh, for our work online. <clears throat> Best media team projects and some that eventually did not work out. Well, I wouldn't rank them by quality because I don't feel like I should or there's a need to. They were all equally really good. Uh, we already mentioned the stuff that didn't work out, have it be due to lack of submissions or lack of quality uh, with the submissions. Um, but in general, projects were very interactive with the delegates, and that's what we were most proud to see um, regarding internal communication projects, so stuff that was just purely session related. Uh, with the external communication, we were incredibly happy with um, our amazing editorial assistant Daniela Timpano who did the three part uh, series on the shift from analog to digital and UAP and how the network changed in the span of well, well, the three decades now. Um, so that was refreshing to see and getting feedback from some older alumni um, on that. We tried our best to um, kind of focus on past, present and future at the same time with projects. So we um, have more stuff in store, which is mostly due to the fact that we had like a very short time span of planning. So a lot of stuff was pushed post session. Um, so keep an eye out for those on the official uh, EYP channels, such as EYP Network on Instagram and the official Facebook page of EYP. Okay, um, so we're going to do five more questions. Um, if you feel like there's a really important question we haven't covered yet, just upload them so that um, they're going to turn up. <clears throat> what do you think about implementing VR into session? Um, I think it's just not as common yet. Um, it's probably something that you could think of in the future. Um, but now it would limit the pool of participants and we didn't really want that because well, I'm quite sure out of the 100 people that attended the webinar today, probably only two or three have even the VR technology. So it's not really inclusive. <clears throat> what was the motivation of participants and how did you manage participants' motivation, having in mind that basically they need to sit in front of their computer for four whole days? Um, I think we answered that already, but it was mostly about morning and evening program that really engaged them and also all the aspects were really engaging. <clears throat> um, not only are there options hosted in, in Europe, there are also many open source options that can be hosted even independently. Um, okay, so apparently my answer was inaccurate. Um, what I basically tried to say was we had this really limited time frame of only four weeks. Um, so we didn't have the opportunity to first of all check all the options and secondly um, to, I mean open source is more mainly um, connected like at least in my mind that you also have to do a lot of setup and Zoom for instance is a platform just ready to use. You can sign up, you can step in um, and that's kind of the approaches we search for. Um, how many people do you need for each of the teams? Um, this time we had 10 academic people. Um, we had plus three VPs, plus one president. We had two editors, six people on the media team, 77 delegates and um, 10, 11 organizers. Um, and I think most of the team sizes were quite good. Uh, just smaller for the, why we downsized on this is that there was no need for like a traditional format where every committee has a journalist allocated to them since they're not physically present in the committee room and there was no need for them to monitor it. So downsizing would be a plus at uh, future digital events. Okay, and one last question. 
Um, will there be a physical? Okay, we already had that. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that was it for the webinar from our side. Um, if you still have additional questions, um, feel free to contact me via email. Um, it's basically my name. So Christopher dot note then the note is n o e at eyp.de if you have any further questions um but yeah i think we covered most of it um thank you very much for attending and i really hope to see a lot of digital events in future um valeria do you still have anything to say yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone who is still with us. And uh, I will now unmute all of you. So as you leave, you can choose to say goodbye to us in your native language. We doesn't. Okay. <laughs> How long? How long? Goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Ciao, <laughs> 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 <laughs>